All right, guys, welcome back to episode five. Bunch of stuff to show you. Gordon's Ranger, 95 Ranger. We're gonna go over this thing in detail because it's ready to leave. And then we're also gonna hit high desert fasteners today. That's where I go to get all my nuts, bolts, bunch of hardware. So let's check everything out. So we have my friend Joe Gutierrez, 68 Camaro. Uh, he asked if we could just do a brake upgrade on it. So we decided to put Willwood brakes all the way around. He likes rally wheels. He wanted to keep 14s and 15s. That's what it had. So we got a brake kit that fits 14 inch four piston calipers, but it fits under a 14 inch wheel. Well, come to find out the only wheel it doesn't fit under a 14 inch diameter is a rally wheel. The way the wheels folded and welded on the inside barely hit. So. We ended up putting a 15 inch rally wheel on it. So now it has 15 15s, repowder coated the wheels. Can't really tell the difference at all. So he's stoked and happy. So now we got bigger brakes on this thing, disc all the way around, four piston calipers all the way around. And also once we were into it, just like a lot of these projects go, we realized all the suspension, every bushing, every ball joint just completely hammered. It's just old. So could have been original stuff, most likely. So he bought this thing new in 1970 from his brother-in-law. You know, being a 68 Camaro, I think his brother-in-law bought it brand new in 67, right when the 68 model came out. So it's been in his family the whole time. So that's super cool. I can't remember the gentleman's name that designed that rear traction bar back in the early 70s but he wanted to keep it kind of era specific like that. So we just repowder coated the traction bar, new leaf springs, new discs in the rear, new shocks all the way around, new upper and lower control arms, ball joints, bushings, all the steering new, tie rods, pitman arm, drag link, everything. So things should run and drive, you know, super good, as good as they did in 1968. So anyways, yeah, just a clean, simple Camaro. I don't know if that was a 327 or a 350. Both were available in 1968. So I'll actually ask him when I see him and he picks it up. But anyways, we're done with that. Just a quick, easy job. 69 Barracuda. So we have the mini tubs. They came in yesterday along with the rear leaf spring relocation kit. I think in one of the prior episodes, maybe episode three, we were talking about whether we were gonna fully tub this thing or mini tub it. We're gonna go ahead and mini tub it. We're gonna keep it on leaf springs on Caltrax. Caltrack bars work really, really well. We're just gonna move everything in. If we have to notch the frame rail, we will. Uh, but if we can get it accomplished with just putting a larger wheel tub in, we'll do that. That way it keeps our reupholstery on the inside to a minimum. Uh, everything's pretty much done in the front as far as the Hemi installation. Uh, Marty is currently working on this support heim. You can see this up underneath here, Ryan. We need to make a mount for this support heim right here. So we're gonna insert a nut plate on this open square tube frame rail right here with two holes. That way you can tighten it down. You wouldn't have to do any welding on it or anything that way. So yeah, we'll install that. And the whole point of all this steering and doing all that and having to do this with this rack and pinion is, and I think we went over it in a previous episode, the Hemi's so large and so wide that the cylinder head in the bottom of the block where the cylinder head mounts covers the steering hole. So we had to move everything off to the left a little bit. So. Uh, but that's the last of it. Radiators fit. We got to make upper and lower uh, radiator hoses. We'll make those out of stainless. Other than that, we're ready to get on the rear end of this thing, do the mini tub, uh, complete exhaust system, and he'll be down the road. So should be a fun, cool driver and should be a quick little car. Like I said, the, the two off-road trucks, the Willys and the 65 F100, those are our main priorities. So anytime I have extra manpower, we're working on this thing. and. Well, the Camaro we were working on, but we're just gonna keep it simple for a little while. We got a few vehicles leaving, so that way it allows me to put more manpower on the Willys and the 65 F100. So one of the things the guys are working on right now is, this is the exit for the transmission coolers for the 49 Willys. So we're half tank rolling, and then we'll TIG weld this together, and then we'll file it all off. So that way it doesn't have a square edge right here, it has a radius edge on it. And so this piece right here, I'll show you where it goes, Ryan. You can see he's bead rolling the edge right here. Normally we'll have a virgin piece of aluminum with no sand marks on it, but we actually had it squared off. We didn't like it, so we cut it apart. Now we're half tank rolling it. The reason that we had it squared off is this actually sits underneath the main structure. You don't see it, but once we had it tacked together, it still wasn't good enough. We just thought aesthetically it would look considerably better with a half tank roll on it. So the transmission coolers sit flush right here. We're gonna have two exits. So this exit curves up, comes to here. We have a seven inch opening right here for air to escape out around the tire. So that's about this height. Then 
from these tanks, we'll have another piece that comes up and it's almost level with the tire with the same seven inch radius. So you have two exits, one for your radiator and one for the transmission coolers. And we'll see if we can get that in there on this episode so you can kind of get a just of what it looks, what it's gonna look like. So as far as the willies, last episode, I think we were still in the plumbing. Plumbing is finally wrapped up. The last piece of plumbing left is the fuel cell vent. And the only reason we haven't done it is once those coolers are done, the spare tire mounts done, the bedsides are on and the tailgate trunk area, that stuff kind of dictates where we're gonna route that. So that's the only reason we haven't finished that. All other plumbing's done for every other system. All the skid plates are on and done for the rear of the vehicle. So these two on the rear, we have the main belly skid pan to do. We'll do that very last. But I think Ryan, if we probably can get a creeper if you wanna see underneath this thing as far as the plumbing goes, it's pretty, pretty badass. And then we also have all the electronics mounted. We have the two Switch Pros mounted. Uh, we have the Race Pack PDM Smart Wire, Dominator. We actually had an HP for this. It won't control the transmission. So now we have a Dominator computer going here. This simulates the Dominator computer and the height that it, everything is. So this will sit up in here behind the LCQ screen. I'm sorry, the 12 inch Pro Dash. So that sits up in there. That simulates the computer. The reason why is because we haven't had a, the availability of Holly computers. Right now, currently, Nick is working on the hood. We have the grill welded on. We didn't want this to be two separate pieces. We wanted this mid section of the grill to go up with the hood. So we welded all this together. We also have all the under structure done for the hood. So the hood's super rigid now. Right now, Nick is making the nut plate mounts. We call them nut plates. They actually will move around, gives the hood a little bit of adjustability before you tighten that down on the hinge. So he's working on the hinge points and the nut plates right now. And then we'll have this thing hinging pretty quick here. We still have lighting to do on the front. So we're gonna do some, probably some KC DOT approved seven inch lights here. We'll probably do Flex Era 4s. We'll probably do Flex Era 4 KC lights in the front right here in front of the grill. And then a bunch of under lightings. We call them work lights. That way you can work on the vehicle at nighttime if you ever have an issue. A bunch of lighting around the engine, suspension, underneath the vehicle. So since we have all the plumbing wrapped up, I wanted to show you what it looks like underneath because it looks kind of like a brewery. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty intense how much plumbing goes into these things. So uh, I was going to turn it over to Nick and uh, he can explain what he did as far as all the plumbing goes and what, how he routed everything and why he routed that stuff that way. Let's do it. So there's a lot going on down here. It's a narrow truck, big 480 transfer case, and we want to leave as much headroom and clearance for the driver as possible. He's like six foot two, six foot three. So we actually kind of boat side the truck up a little bit, which gave us some room down here so we can store things down here, um, which let us, which helped us plan certain things. Like we can get our shifter down here. There's a big AccuSump, which is like an oil uh, accumulator. Right down in here is blue, it's wrapped in paper. But um, so we could try to stick as many things up underneath the truck as possible. So some plumbing things we got coming through here. We got our two main fuel lines up top, dash 10 feed, dash eight return. This cool little guy from Motion Raceworks, it's a basically an E85 sniffer, it'll sense how much ethanol is in the fuel. And so if you're running 91 and you want to switch to E85, you can just do it on the fly and it will sense how much is in the fuel and automatically adjust the tune. There's nothing you do on your part, it's just like driving a brand new, you know, Denali or Yukon or something, nice brand new truck. But uh, so that's our fuel lines coming up through here. We, we would like to do as many hard lines as possible on this chassis because once you set it up, it's going to be very difficult to get on top of the transmission up here without pulling, you know, the interior access panels open. So the hard lines are pretty nice because they're set and forget. Once you get them and lock them in, you don't have to worry about anything ever rubbing on them or ripping the braiding on it or nothing. You, you know, it takes very few line clamps to hold them in place because they hold their own shape. And so you and just plan out your uh, nuts and ferrules. We can swing a wrench to them fairly easily, and the rest is just set and forget. So other things we have going on down here in this area, you'll see all the lines for the heater core and the uh, vintage air box. So our two AC lines are coming up through here. We also got the heater core lines, our heater control valve. Everything's kind of made to route around the transmission so the trans can come in and out without opening up any of these lines here. Uh, other things we got going on, you can kind of see up top, the brake lines come through, goes pokes through for the handbrake. You know, haul dash three stainless line. You know, we run those as far as we can so we have as few nuts and ferrules as possible. And that's these guys here, it's the nut. The little ferrule goes uh, inside of it and it's an and fitting, so it's a tapered fit. So pretty much once you seal it, it's metal on metal and that's that's that. But we try to keep as few of those as possible because every fitting is a chance for leaks. So run our brake line as far as we can get them. Same with the uh, the fuel lines here. Trying to do as big of a line as possible. Look over here, we got the water lines for this truck. 
So front engine, radiators in the back, and we got water lines to go front to back on it. Inch and a half lower, inch and a quarter on the upper. And they're all stainless steel, uh, per 12 of everything, meaning there was an argon, we ran argon backing gas on the inside of the, of the tube as we were welding it. Helps prevent sugar and corrosion on the inside. And uh, sugar is kind of like when you, if you ever weld stainless, you get that really black kind of very coarse stuff on the inside. It, it protects the inside of the tube so the inside weld looks like the outside weld does. And it just makes it smoother for water and it just makes it a stronger weld so vibration won't uh, affect it as much. We'll do the same thing on headers and exhaust. Maybe build those out. These guys we made semi-modular, so we ran, tried to tuck it up the best we can so you could pull engine, sorry, you could pull the transmission, the transfer case without messing with any of these guys. And if you do need to get them out, they're fairly easy with the purple Wiggins fittings you see uh, up in this area. You know, it doesn't take many tools. This Wiggins fitting comes off by hand. A 5 16 gets the hose clamps off that hold these things in place and you can pop them out. Uh, above that, we have our transmission lines. You know, our, our feed and our return from the transmission. And then all hard lined out. We like to put a filter on it as well, just to protect things, you know, circling from uh, the transmission to the coolers. From here, we'll go soft line to the transmission with uh, a couple dry brake fittings, which I'll show you one of those in a second. But they're basically, you can disconnect your line without spilling any fluid and it keeps whatever pressure's in your line. So to pull a transmission, there's no more draining the pan and draining all the fluid from the coolers far away. You just click your line off, drop your transmission out. Your fluid stays in the truck and it stays in the pan and it doesn't get on the floor all over you. So they're pretty pretty nice if you can plan ahead for them. Uh, we're running those on various spots on the vehicle too. Some in the brake lines and the uh, intercooler lines as well. Scooting back, so coming back further out of the chassis, you can see the brake lines are snaking through. This dash, that's this dash three stainless line here. He'll jump to the rear end and go to both rear tires. This dash four line you see here is for the uh, the transmission, so if it vents and pushes off any extra fluid, it'll squirt it all the way up to the rear of the vehicle. That way it doesn't drop and then cover everything behind it. So we're trying to get all of our vents to the back bumper. Again, you got your fuel lines, they bulkhead and they'll keep snaking up and along and work their way up to the fuel cell. This side over here, this dash six line you see is a vent from the AccuSump, that's the oil accumulator there. And that guy's pretty cool, if you get a drop in oil pressure, it keeps a couple quarts on hand and it will shove oil into your pan and keep your engine lubricated. But in the event you get too much pressure in your engine, it can also squirt off excess pressure. And again, this vent will go all the way out to the rear bumper. One of the reasons we chose hard lines on, on this truck, one is just it's difficult to get to. So if you can set it and forget it, that's great. But also this thing's gonna have ducting to come up and feed the radiator above us. And so I needed everything to hold itself up as close to the body as possible. So we could build a sheet metal plenum to suck air up into the radiator. So being hard lines, they hold themselves in place. You don't have to deal with zip ties and trying to hold a bunch of soft lines together and eventually having them sag. These guys will stay right put and we could build our plenum right around them and not worry about the two scratching each other or rubbing. So one of the cool things with doing these sheet metal side bulkheads here, what we call them, is it gave us a flat surface to run plumbing or wiring or anything onto. So we can come up here, like this is our, our diff, rear differential vent. Then we have the oil vent off the AccuSump. We can attach those guys just fine. Up above them, up here is our transmission lines. So everything can run along these, these paths and you know, kind of like little train tracks going throughout this truck. But just easy to tie on a line clamp or anything wherever you need to on the chassis. You have a spot you can drill and tap it. You know, this stuff's uh, 100,000 thick, so it's almost an eighth inch thick, so it's enough to run 1032 bolts into all day long. And just makes it easier as you build this thing out to make parts removable. You know, with how tight the chassis is, if you need to pull something, it's quick and easy for most things. And again, up here, uh, we got our water lines, we've got the Wiggins clamp. The biggest thing with these Wiggins clamps, uh, actually with any Wiggins clamp, is you have two ferrules that come together and then there's a sleeve that goes over it. And so what you want to do is make these things in a way where they both point the same direction. So if you have to remove it, you can pull the part off. You can have them go opposing directions. Rob's uh, truck has one like that where you have to drop the part in first and then shove the, um, this little gray piece on each way. So you can do it, but in this configuration where they both point the same way, it's the easiest way to do it. Pop each one off under your hose clamp and then the part will pull out or press back on easily. So we try to set up as many as we can in this way so you can easily just pop them in and out without fighting it too hard. And then again, they just spring click back on and it's sealed. Um, so that's a little tip if you ever do use Wiggins clamps or anything similar to them. If you can keep them pointing the same direction or even opposing at 90 degrees, you can still wiggle them out easily to you know uninstall or install. If you look over on that side of the uh, 
chassis there. You see you have your dash 10 line, the lower one coming up and down, that's the fuel feed. Above that's the dash eight, that's the fuel return. So we're trying just to keep this thing as symmetrical as we can. Two vents below that, one's a radiator vent for the overflow and the other one's the transmission vent, both are dash four. And uh, we've got them both stopped for now here till we figure out some more in the rear and then we'll keep running all the way to the back end of the chassis. So any fluid will dump out the back bumper. So there's a lot going on in this thing. It's a tiny space with about every bell and whistle you can get for uh, any hot rod or off-road truck. So we'll start the front, AC condenser, Fan. He's got a couple AC lines that come through. Had to get creative with the fittings on it. So Vintage Air makes these little fittings here. They're very tight and compact, 90 degree. Designed this bracket around this style fitting here. You know, hose end, about a 180 hose end. And even on this side here, we had to uh, make our own hose end just so we can route through the chassis or through the uh, around the coolers. So I took a couple different hose ends, weld, purge weld them together, pressure test them. If everything's good, then you know, carry on from there. AC lines will route down. Certain spots on the chassis, the AC lines will go to a hard line like this because the AC hose is so thick, it doesn't bend very easily. It takes a long time to, uh, to complete a turn. The uh, AC hard lines are made of an aluminum. They turn much sharper, so I can nail this corner really easy. You know, there's a lot already going on. I can have one less big giant hose down there. So he'll go to hard line. And then he'll pop back out if you want to follow me on this side. And one of the hard lines will pop out here. And then we have a soft line to keep, so that way we do have some, a uh, little bit of vibration going on here off the uh, AC compressor. And we have our two high and low inputs here to charge your AC system. Set them up so it's e easy to pop a panel off, hook onto them, charge your system, be done. And the rest of the lines out of the compressor will go down and actually follow on top of these uh, water lines here that we saw earlier. And they'll swoop right back up the mid plate back here and they'll go into the, the AC box under the, uh, the, the console there. That's the first of many things in here. The next thing working back is the intercoolers. I guess the intercooler heat exchangers. So CBR custom built these for us, fit a certain height requirement to fit under the hood and a certain width to fit around the coilovers here, where you can still have some room to get a spanner on your coilover and adjust your, your ride height. These guys take a dash 12, so that's about a three quarter inch line. So everything on that means is big. The hose, the hose ends are big, the hose itself is big and it's not so flexible and controllable. So had to route those uh, long gentle curves. They go from here, swoop down, basically through our little um, tunnel down there. One will go around the back of the engine, straight into the back of the blower, where it hits the intercooler inside the blower. Uh, the other one will come down and swoop down around into an intercooler pump over here and a reservoir, which is your water reservoir. You check your fluid level. And this pump is right here is in a Mazir electric pump. It'll flow everything for you. Just like a water pump will for your radiator, this works on the, uh, the same principles. So we keep coming back. Uh, next, we, Charlie at Power Steering Solutions custom built us this little uh, power steering reservoir here. Got it kind of small as he could for this type of steering system to uh, fit inside the chassis. Reservoir gets a couple dash 10 lines off it. Here, these guys will swoop down and around and back up to the pump. An anti-spike valve on the other side. The bottom will go, this one will go to the pump. This one feeds the pump. With power steering, we try to get our pump as low as you can, your reservoir as high as you can, and then it can easily feed your pump and prime your system when you fill it the first time. You know, if you can't do that, it's not the end of the world. It just makes it a little harder to prime your pump. Um, we also did a hard line breather off of this guy. He kind of snakes down the chassis here. It's dash four, so quarter inch. And he'll snake his way all the way down, fall you know, close to the frame rail and dump out the floor. If you have anything overheated, too much pressure build up, you won't you know, get everything messy in here. It'll just dump out of the floor. Uh, the other side, you can see a bit of what's going on with steering. Yeah, there's a lot going on in here, I, so it might be a little hard to follow. Um, along the steering shaft, with this one being a rack vehicle, you get a steering servo. He's mounted up here. You know, one line's low pressure. That's a normal AN line. The other one's high pressure, so he's got to be hydraulic and cramped and all that good stuff. These ones are not the most flexible either, so you try to plan you know, your route as best you can you can't bend this stuff very sharp. Um, so he's built on a removable bracket. Uh, you need to pull the engine. You have to pull this guy first and he can pop right in and out. He bolts in three places to make it stable and stout. The bottom will have two high pressure hoses. You can see them coming here and they'll go all the way to the rack and that controls left and right turning. So they'll snake through the center of the, the bulkhead where everything else goes and they come back around to here. So you get your left and right. You know, they'll, be, they'll be protected with a skid plate in the front paneling on the top so you won't even know they're there. Another thing with the steering, you have an anti-spike valve. Um, not the most up to date on what these do. I know they take excess pressure and they'll push it off in the reservoir if you need to. Uh, that's, again, that's from Charlie at Power Steering Solutions. He's right here in town. Pretty much best in the business for the steering stuff. Coming down low towards the bottom, right here we have our um, 
Another pump from Power Steering Solutions. This is billet pump, pretty much best you can get for these trucks. And he's mounted down low. You know, he'll feed from the reservoir we saw on the other side and then create pressure up to the servo and run everything through there. And also in the steering system, is a steering cooler here. So it helps keep the, uh, the fluid cool so it doesn't, you know, it's basically so that it works better with the hydraulics. A lot going on with the steering and a little amount of space. So, you know, with this kind of stuff, it helps to plan as best you can. I like to keep a lot of options too when I'm plumbing these trucks. So I'll keep a variety of different hose ends, a variety of different fittings. So I can know if I need a 135, a 150 or a 180 or whatever I need, you know, it's best to buy a few extras so you can play with them. And then, you know, that way you have the option to do everything you need to do. So down here we have our hard lines, uh, dash three hard lines for the brakes. They'll ride the back of the arm. After this stuff gets nickel plated, we'll drill holes and tap it for line clamps to keep everything held in place. Uh, until then, the nickel plating will, if you drill the holes first, the fluid will come out as there's nickel plating and it'll create a not so desirable color effect on it. So we drill the holes last after plating. Um, soft lines jump anywhere that turns. So you'll get a soft line here, soft line back up the chassis. Leave some room on these things because long travel trucks will move quite a bit. So you need to have enough flex in the hose and so nothing kinks. And same with this. You need to leave enough flex in your hose to go up and down and left and right. So all throughout that, make sure you can cycle this thing and it, nothing's uh, pulling or kinking or, or squishing it. Uh, down in here, we have a, um, it's a Hertz line lock. So the cool thing with this is it does two things. One, it splits, it has one input coming from your pedal and your, uh, your master cylinder into it and it'll split so left and right of the car but the second thing it does is you can press a button you know hold the brake down press a button it'll keep pressure on the front brakes but it'll release pressure on the rear brakes and you can do pretty big burnouts so cool little feature you know not too hard to add these things to the trucks and if you got you know enough horsepower why not have that coming up on the brake system up top a little hard to see in here we got some jmr master cylinders we keep a little, keep quarter turn ball valves on these things if you need to do any service on the front or rear you can close them off or if you lose front or rear brakes you can close, let's say you lose a rear brake line, you can close the rear brake line off and still have front brakes. That's a cool little feature. A couple of with residual valves behind it. Uh, those keep pressure on the actual brake calipers themselves. That way they, uh, they stay open enough to let the rotor spin and don't move around too much. So we always put those in line and then those, these two will go to the front and rear of the chassis. Uh, on top of the master, this is where it feeds from the brake reservoir. So these guys will be dash four, uh, a little bigger just because it's not pressurized, so let the fluid flow uh, flow easier through it. You know, we have the JMR master cylinder here. In between the two, we have what's called a dry brake. And those dry brakes are hiding right here. And I'll, uh, I'll actually go grab a, a big version of a dry brake so you can see it easily in detail. But it allows us to uh, remove this piece if we need to get behind it. Click the dry brake, no brake fluid will spill, and you can easily pull this piece out, do your work below it, put it back in, and uh, click it together. So let me grab one of those and uh, show you guys what they're, what they're all about. So this here is a Dash 12 dry brake. This dry brake's gonna go in line on the intercoolers. So if we need to pull intercoolers, you, you can uncl unclick it and go. Basically what it does is it's spring-loaded. So right now it's held in place by this pin. If you push it up and twist it, it will release itself. And this will seal each end of the hose. So we're trying to put as many of these as possible on this truck. Because it's so tight, you know, there will be times where you have to remove a cooler or something to work. And if you can easily, pop your line off, you know, pull the coolers out, get to whatever you gotta do and put it back in without having to drain the system, clean up your mess, refill it, prime it, go through everything. Uh, just makes life way easier. So we, we keep two of these here. These are Dash 4 dry brakes from Vibrant Performance. That's for the reservoir. Again, you can un unclick these guys. This reservoir cross member unbolts and get out of the way and then get down to the fuel lines. There's a bunch of sensors back there, intercooler lines and other things. So. They're just real handy, real quick to operate, and it just makes sense for just about any truck to have these nowadays, especially on things like a, a transmission. If you need to pull a transmission, it's always a mess, but with this, it'll be no problem. So we've got two of these breathers are from Racetronics, and what they do is they take extra pressure from the crankcase, and it comes into here. There's baffles in here, so any oil that might be in the line gets trapped down here, and they'll blow the extra pressure, pressurized air out this filter here. Um, these guys are pretty sweet. They come with a nice little petcock valve down here to drain, drain your fluid out. We try to put these things in a place where you can get a little bin down there, or a little cup, and drain your oil into, so it's you know, not much of a mess. They also have a sight glass on them. Makes it nice to know if you're, if you're full or not. And this is a Dash 10 line supplying it. 
He loops out and around, and it'll go into these uh, valve covers we got from Maruzzi, and they have a dash 10 fitting out the front. So any pressure built up in the head on the valve covers is pushed out and out through here. Um, pretty much essential to have on anything with high horsepower. You know, on this vehicle, because of the space, we ran two, we ran one on each side, so the left and the right, one for each valve cover, uh, just for space constraints. It's, you know, if I could run a hose less distance across this chassis, the better. Okay, so that kind of wraps up what we got going on with the willies, all the plumbing, uh, skid plates, hood, you know, electronics, bodywork, stuff like that. So the 65 F100, we are kind of in the uh, neck and neck stretch on both these things. So we're plumbing this as well. We have the fuel fillers done. I think last time this whole complete assembly was out, the tank was still in, but the top and the transmission coolers were out. So we have all the top side stuff done and plumbed. So both fuel pumps, both fuel filters into the Y with the check valve so it can't backflow. Uh, we have the transmission coolers mounted with all the trans coolers and the bulkheads for that to pass through this plate. So these are the two bulkheads, and this is where the trans or the uh, fuel lines go down underneath, runs up the trans tunnel to the engine, and then on the opposite side here, the transmission cooler lines go through these bulkheads and go up the frame rail to the transmission. Uh, there's a panel that Zeus fastens on over here, so it keeps that all protected. I'll show you underneath where we are with all the fuel lines and transmission lines so far. So we got the rotor hats. We're gonna put the rotors on and then we'll get our mount for the caliper and then our bump pad right here for the strike, the strike pad on the rear end for the bump stop. And then we're pretty much done with fabrication on the back end of this thing. But let, yeah, let's dive underneath and I'll show you that stuff, Ryan. Okay, so Ryan, as you can see here, we're missing a muffler right now. But we, he, since he's doing this side, this muffler's in place to make sure we're clearing. We have enough clearance for all our fuel lines. And all these fuel lines get heat jacketing on it. That stuff works really, really well to keep the fuel temps down around hot exhaust components. But you can see the two fuel lines come through here. This is the dash 10 that feeds the engine, feeds both frame rails or fuel rails. So this is the GM flex fuel sensor. This senses how much E85, the percentage of the E85 that's in the fuel system and adjusts boost accordingly. Uh, this piece right here that this plugs into, uh, this dash 10 piece, it flows actually more than a dash 10 can flow. Uh, this is from Mo Motion Raceworks. They make a bunch of cool products for us that help us out. We have the Y here that branches off to both fuel rails. And then once it exits the fuel rails, it comes back to a fuel pressure regulator. That's what regulates how much pressure the fuel rails have. And then the fuel pressure regulator returns. There'll be another hard line right here. It returns to this dash eight, which goes back up into the tank. So that's what completes the, the fuel system. On this side, we have the transmission filter, which the hot exiting out of the transmission goes into the transmission filter, goes up into the transmission coolers, and then returns back this way and back into the cool side of the transmission. So obviously the transmission's out of here. Next episode, we'll have all that plumb plus the rest of the plumbing on this thing wrapped up. Uh, all the brake lines are wrapped up mid chassis all the way down to the rear end. We just don't have the actual brake lines on the rear end. We'll wait to mount the calipers to do that. Same thing with the front. We're not going to continue with, with uh, these steel radius arms. We're gonna do billet aluminum radius arms. We'll be bring the brake lines down onto these radius arms and that's how we follow it down to the front calipers. So you can see this is one of the front brake lines. So it has a bulkhead, a 90 degree bulkhead, and there'll be a piece of, this will be actually twisted forward, but there'll be a, a piece of flex, probably a five inch piece of flex that goes to our radius arm right here. And then it'll run down the radius arm. This radius arm connects to the I-beam, and then that's how we jump over to the caliper. So we also have all the electronics wrapped up in the 65 F100. So we have our two switch pros mounted. We have our Holly HP computer. The race pack PDM goes in this area right here. We just don't have it mounted at the moment. I believe that's what that hole is for, is for one of the mounts for the race pack PDM. Uh, we have the gauges in now. You can see those from the other side and the Holly LCQ touchscreen. This side right here will get an iPad mount when we're done. So the dash actually, we made it unbolt. It'll get upholstered. There'll be an iPad mount right here for lead navigation or anything the passenger wants to toggle through. Okay, so the 69 all-wheel drive Datsun 510, we have not made a lot of progress. We're too busy with these other builds. We did get a little bit of time to do some drawing on the computer, which we'll show you that as well. We have spent a little bit of time here uh, kind of chiseling out the main bulkhead structure for the rear. You can see the rear differential here. You can see the wheel and tire and strut assembly. I don't know if this window is gonna stay. We're just cutting some windows out to shave weight. And this will all be 90,000 chromoly plate welded together. So, you know, it's gonna be a pretty light part. You can also see here we have the lower suspension pivot. 
we have the chassis tube right here, the rear differential. And if you, and you can zoom in, yeah, you can see how this suspension arm actually is planing up right now. That's because we're building the car at bump, which I had mentioned in a previous episode. So we build the car completely bottomed out. So at the ride height that it has, that arm will be completely level. It's a nice feature to be able to design this stuff on the computer and cycle everything, make sure everything's gonna work theoretically. Sometimes the real world is slightly different for some reason, but yeah. it gets us close and helps us figure this stuff out instead of spending a ton of time mechanically trying to move stuff around and, yeah. and cycle things. So it's a yeah. big time saver. And one thing I'll add here is um, when doing this kind of stuff, you know, we have it on the fixture table over there. So we know where our strut needs to live in space. We know where the suspension arms live and the, and the uh, rear differential, all that stuff. And if you want to look at the screen here, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just measure those points and I'll throw this stuff in space where it needs to be. And I'll start with a real basic shape, just something that gets me all, all my points in general. So I get around my suspension pivots, around the chassis tubes, uh, the diff sitting inside of it and the coilover sits up here. And we'll just start playing with just cutting the basic solid shape. Um, just doing, you know, just throwing different cuts at it, different cuts, different angles and stuff. And it's a quick, easy way to mess with the shape and get an idea what we're doing before you get into sheet metal and start component, start designing a bunch of individual components around it. So it's just easy for us to go on the fly, just now nah, let's put a triangle there, nope, change that, let's do, you know, add a different shape there. Just for us to mess around as if we were sketching on paper, because none of us are yeah. drawing on their hands. <laughs> yeah, <so>. there's some <laughs> guys out there that are super good at drawing, yeah. but uh, us, eh, you know. Yeah, I need a, I need a ruler yeah. to make a, a straight Some guys line. are good with a pencil. I'm not gonna mention any names, Morgan no. Clark. Yeah, he <laughs> he's good at it, <laughs> so. But uh, yeah, so we just start just ch chunking away at it until we see what we like and then we'll refine it from there. But if anyone doing stuff in SOLIDWORKS, it makes it easier to build sheet metal components this way, at least for me it does. And then uh, after that, you can actually convert the outside faces to sheet metal, pretty straightforward. So the quick, easy way to get from a bunch of points in space to a shape and then to a structure. Okay, the day's finally come. Gordon's 95 Ranger, just about got it wrapped up. Should be leaving Friday. Just wanted to go over the build. I don't think we've done that yet. I think we've showcased this thing a little bit here and there, but ultimately we haven't gotten over the details. I just want to go over how we started with this project. So Gordon came to me quite a while ago, actually, I think maybe a solid four years ago on this project, and they normally don't take that long, but the project has changed shape quite a few times throughout the build. So initially when we got in the truck, we weren't going to get really crazy with it. I remember I had set Gordon in my Ranger and asked him if he wanted the, you know, the interior like that, if he wanted the truck like that. And he said, no, definitely not. That, it's just too much. Like, I don't need to go that crazy with it. Well, as you, the build went on, things started changing. So it went from a V6 Ranger, which we were gonna put a supercharger on it from a company called Modbox, to a LS3. 418 cubic inch built by Maruzzi. So we got that change done, got the engine in, got the headers built, got the intake system done for it, the drive system designed and done for it, everything down to the throttle cable. Like if we wired it and, and put fluids to it, then we would have been able to fire it up. At that point, Gordon decided, well, I want some more horsepower, so let's put a supercharger on it. So that changed everything. Different intake system. We got to keep the headers, luckily, but it changed the fuel injectors, the, even how the, the throttle system, top cross member, the supports for the shocks, that had to change to make room for the supercharger. It just changed a ton and ton of stuff. So that just keeps adding time when those changes are made. So ultimately, now this thing makes 600 horsepower to the wheels with the supercharged 418 inch LS3 from Maruzzi. We were hoping to make some more power and we could get more aggressive and make more power, but because of the summer coming up, the heat, I don't want to throw a bunch of timing at it. We're going to stay a little bit towards the conservative side, but we couldn't ramp it up more since it is flex fuel capable and we can run E85 on it. So we have I-beam front suspension. We have Fox shocks. We have 2.5 coilovers and 3.5 bypasses in the front with 4.0 bypasses in the rear. Has 30 inches of rear wheel travel and it has 20 inches of front wheel travel. Swing steer, all hydraulic steering from Charlie at Power Steering Solutions. We use his box, his Ram, and his trophy truck pump. The pump, the drive system, all that's designed by us. Uh, alternators from DC Power Engineering. It was painted by Travis Sylvester at Sylvester's Custom. It has the Lumalore. Uh, logo for his company clutch and coffee so this lights up in the evening time all this kind of off-white is luminescent paint and it lights up so that's super neat feature um, our signature series shock mounts it's another thing i wanted to point out is 
So we still have the stock frame in the rear. It's kicked a little bit, but ultimately had we known in the very beginning that we were gonna go this far with this, I would have chopped the whole back of this thing off and, and built it that way instead of retrofitting what we had. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it's very important once you pencil out a plan in the beginning, you have to be very cautious of the changes you make because it affects everything else down the road. So ultimately it's good to pencil out a plan and try to stick with it. And if you have any, if you have any idea that you might upgrade in the future, that it needs to be built accordingly or those upgrades need to be incorporated right in the beginning of the build. So we have a spare drive shaft, spare tie rod. We always have that fire extinguisher on the back, transmission coolers, 54 gallon fuel cell in the rear with two Aeromotive A1000 pumps feeding this thing. We have our spare tire assembly that we always, well, that we like to do on most of the trucks where it just cam locks this portion, puts pressure in the center of the rear tires. That's what holds the tires on. KC lights for backup lights, all of our paneling work that we like to do. It's got a pin right here. You pull that pin and you got trunk in the rear here. Sorry, I hadn't been open in a while, so the gas struts are. We have extra oil, we have an onboard air compressor, the jack handles and the jack are stored in this trunk, fully sealed from the elements. Dust always finds a way somehow, but this thing is as sealed up as we can get. It's pretty much waterproof. So we have some plates that we've added for weight to the rear of the chassis since the, we have a mid fuel cell instead of a rear mounted fuel cell. You can see these uh, ballast plates that we've made. There's some up underneath too. And normally we'll do aluminum skid plate, but we did a steel 250 thou thick skid plate on the back of this thing just to get our rear weight biased in the 53% range, which it's actually 53.4% rear weight. This truck has a ton of amenities on it. Just so many features. We've never done this much stuff on an off-road truck. So radar detectors, sirens, EMP protection, like it just has a ton of cool stuff on it, uh, but it just adds a bunch of weight. So this truck's a solid 7,000 pounds. I think just a hair under 7,000 pounds by 30 pounds. So um, full of fuel, ready to go. So anyways, yeah. And then the jack we have here on the side, Pro Eagle jack, uh, like I said, 30 inches of rear wheel travel. Our trailing arms, that was another thing initially, we weren't gonna do our trailing arms on it. It had trailing arms on it. Gordon decided to upgrade to our trailing arms. The rear end is a Camberg, three and a half inch, 250 wall chromoly housing. In the initial line out of it, we were you know, having the supercharged V6 and we were gonna go with a V8. Now we have a supercharged V8. Knowing that in the beginning, I would have went with a four inch 250 wall housing. That way we could put 36 spline trophy truck axles in this thing. So with 40 spline axles in this thing, it would be my recommendation that the axles get changed out probably every, I don't know, as far as miles and times, but just something to keep an eye on because this thing is heavy and makes quite a bit of horsepower. Eventually it will break an axle. Uh, transmission, we have maximum transmission, turbo 400 in it with billet internals. I think eventually he'll upgrade to a 4L80 transmission with an overdrive and then we can increase the rear gear ratio and give the tire a little, you know, give the truck a little more leverage against the, the weight of the vehicle and the tire itself. So we have race line wheels on it, bead locks, Toyo 37 inch, uh, 12, 5, 17 tires all the way around. Um, KC lighting throughout, electric windows, the inside of the office area here is super nice. So, sorry, excuse the yellow towels. We put those for our feet just so we don't, you know, mess this carpet up before we deliver the vehicle. But Rudy's custom upholstery went through and just did a killer job on the upholstery of this thing. It's one of our aluminum dashes that we build and Rudy covers it with leather. These are Mastercraft seats recovered with leather. Uh, they're heated as well. Uh, we have our impact mount, our signature impact mount here access to the electronics through this panel, two 12 button switch pros, full stereo system inside, rugged radios handles all the car to car communications and the intercoms. We have stereo base control here, a B and M shifter. We have a camber turning brake, adjustable uh, tilt column, Holly LCQ screen in the middle, analog gauges in front of the driver from speed hut. Uh, and then this is the mount for the iPad. We always like to do that for lead navigation. I think I can, if you stay there, Ryan, I'll turn the, uh, the lights on on the inside and you'll be able to see the inside of this thing a little bit better, actually. See the Switch Pros come online. Uh, rear view mirror, nice headliner inside of it. Uh, I think it's a suede headliner. Just a super ultra nice, clean truck. Like probably I would venture to say one of the nicest, cleanest Rangers ever built. And then good performance. Like we have big shocks on it. I think that Ocho Fab is gonna redo a set of front beams for him. He wanted to do, this is the first set of uh, I-beams that he ever built. So he wanted to 
put these ones on his wall and build a way stronger, beefier, gnarlier set for the front. Uh, that'll kind of complete the whole package of this truck and then Gordon doesn't have to worry about smashing through the desert in any way. So it's ultra strong and ultra reliable. Yeah, we have Parker pumpers inside. They're hidden behind panels. Um, everything's kind of hidden, but this truck just has a ton of features. Very, very comfortable, nice interior. Just a nice, super clean truck all, the, all throughout. Desert fasteners. Every now and then, As you can see, they got just about a little bit of everything, even out here. All the wiring terminals, uh, battery cable terminals, eyelets, just all, all kinds of stuff. Anything you could pretty much think of, right? I don't know if you can capture some of this stuff right here, but uh, rivets. Hey, nice to meet you guys. All right, have a good one. I, I didn't want to interrupt. No, you're fine. No worries. No worries. Take care. Yeah. I see, I see you at Eddie's every now and then too. He, yeah, yeah. All he right. That's my fire pits uh, plates for me. We'll, we'll see you over there. All right, we'll see ya. Yeah, zip ties, shrink tube, Zeus buttons, uh, fasteners, plates. They just brought all that stuff in. Yeah, more shrink tube. Here's the people. Here's the magic behind it all right here. <laughs> so it's little Tony, Sherry, and big Tony. Hey, big Tony. What's up, buddy? Hey, how's it going, Rob? Yeah, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming by. Of course, of course. Yeah. Tony's responsible for helping us with all the fastener needs for all the trucks and cars we build. And so uh, they're very stocked up. They have what you're looking for. Super cool thing I wanted to touch base on is Tony, you know, he comes from off-road background, big time. Like, you know, he used to run uh, Baldwin Racing and also uh, ran Lucas Oil off-road racing. So extremely versed in the off-road world and community. And so it's nice to have a guy like that own a fastener shop and run a fastener shop because he brings in the stuff that we're looking for, the stuff that we need to help us build what we're looking for. So before him, we didn't have shoulder bolts and 12 points and right. Zeus fasteners right. up here you know, and stuff that like that. One of the reasons yeah. why we said, hey, you know, we need to have a little something here for us guys, right? Yeah. That because I was coming into the store, sure. and man, we we're I'm having a hard time finding yeah, uh, you know, fasteners and different things that builders need. Us too. Ideas. Yeah. So uh, that was one of the motivations that get us to, to yeah. get in here and kind of change things up a little bit. And I think we've done okay. You've done great. Yeah. You've done great. Yeah, it's it's, been, it's been good. Yeah. Been and it saves us a trip down the hill often. You know, we used to have to go all the way down the hill to get a lot of the fasteners that we needed yeah, and, and a lot of the components. Yep. You know, those have been a huge deal for yep. us, you know, and then, and then uh, uh, you know, the, now we just brought in Zeus buttons and heat shrink yeah. and all the wires and all the tabs that, you know, it's, we try to be more of a on the builder side, on sure. the side. But yeah. Man, we sure have a, a bunch of stuff for the general builder as well. Yeah, construction's probably huge for you, it correct? Is, yeah, really I is. figured. You know, yeah. it's, it's really one of our mainstays. But man, we have a lot of a, a lot more uh, classic car restoration guys up here than I thought. Th then you we never thought. Yeah, quite a few. Quite a few. Hot rod yeah. guys, man, we got tons of them up here. And okay. We got some really good builders too, and, yeah. and obviously, you know, you're the cream of the crop here. I, I don't know about that, but we try hard. So we, that. we, <laughs> we try. That relationship, so that we always have. Well, one thing I also want to touch base on is the community up here. Like, it's cool to have. Obviously, we've been friends before you had this place, but. It's nice to have that community here that, of that circle of people like Ameribraid, you know, they help us out too. They're a great company to work with. Uh, Extreme Powder Coating, you know, we just have like a good small community of people up here that can help us get everything done that we need to get done. And uh, even Extreme Powder Coating, I think they're going to sponsor one of the quarantine cruises coming up. So that's big. That's big and, time. And, that's and, so and, awesome. And, so and, and like, you know, to your point, we have a good core group of uh, fabricators and like-minded 
individuals are builders and, and that can, can get a lot of work done up here in the desert. Yeah. A lot of people think we're up in the desert, you know, we don't have a lot of resources, but we are building and building Certainly. more and more resources where we don't have to go yep. anywhere. And that's, that's kind of one of my goals is for our guys not to have Well, to I think that's kind of an old school way of thinking because there was a time when it was like that up here. And now because we've grown and we've got more people like you with a bunch of knowledge bringing stuff in, it's just easier to do what we need to do. No, so, no, it's been a blessing. Yeah. Sure. And Tony's been instrumental, like pretty rad, helping me. Yeah. It's cool. Awesome. It's super cool. Like this guy's a wealth of knowledge, built a lot of off-road trucks, a bunch of designing. I think even Mario probably was had his hands in there a little bit too, oh, huh? For sure. no, yeah. That's, yeah. So, we were but TV these guys TV. were just state-of-the-art technology, especially back in the '90s when they, he was running Baldwin Racing. I'll never forget you telling me about that that gear drive system of you know we use belts on the front drive of all our trucks and you guys had you know machined gear plates and yeah. each alternator power steering pump everything just plugged right into that gear set so you didn't have to worry about changing belts during the race yeah and we had some tight just tight situations on the motor and the way that the front end geometry was all designed that we had to there was no room for belts or pulleys so we just designed a whole gearbox that all the uh, all the accessories would plug into the yeah. front of it and just bolt in, so there was zero belts, which was... That's so awesome, and you don't even see that today, and that was, you know, 20-some yeah. nice, years nice ago, so yeah. yeah, so yeah. rad, so stuff. cool, yeah. Well, let's, uh, okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Tony, and he's going to give you a quick tour of the place, so you guys, uh, all the local high desert guys, kind of know what they have in stock and some of the components and products that they have here. This is our, our store, our little hardware store, our little high desert fasteners. You know, we kind of start with our grade five, our, our nuts and bolts product here, Grade five goes into grade eight, and then coarse thread, fine thread, right on down the line here. And this kind of this will kind of go all the way down through here if you follow this through here, right into our our stainless. So this is all stainless steel. All of our stainless steel products are button heads. Button heads are pretty popular with the off-road guys. Stainless steel stuff and metric. This is just more of our metric stuff here. 10.9, 8.8, our cap screws. We'll have uh, taps and drills, all size taps and drills. All colors, all of wires, connectors, and some of our backstock back here, more of our fine thread backstock, 12 points, 12 point stuff, jugs. This is not too impressive, but. All the stuff. Oh, stuff. Yeah, we just got, uh, oh, I'll show these stir sticks. We just, uh, the Amerbraid guys over at uh, High Desert Laser just lasered out these drink stir sticks for us, all stainless steel. They also built me that cool little holder there. This is our shipping receiving area. So, got all products. We just, we just received all this products coming in, and it, then we put it in our back stock here. And that's about it. We got, uh, you know, our, our, Office area, cameras. That's about it. All right, cool. We're wrapped up at High Desert Fasteners. Gonna head back to the shop. Uh, didn't even, uh, I walked right past it on the way in, but uh, we have one of Ameribraid's super versatile, amazing belt sanders here. So we're actually going to go to Ameribraid in one of the future episodes here. So we'll show you uh, how this machine's manufactured and uh, introduce you to those people and get everybody in touch with. This is the best belt sander on the planet, hands down. It would take me an hour to give you all the features. So just look forward to that in an upcoming episode. So that should be fun. All right, so I'm heading back to the shop. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe and drop a comment, man. I love comments, love answering people's questions. So we'll catch you guys on episode six. Thanks.